Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on December 7th, 2022 here at First Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. She <laughs> is. We're so excited. Natalie did get commissioned on Sunday to be a commissioned lay pastor and so we're really excited about that. And I think both of us are still trying to figure out what exactly does this mean again and how do we work this out. I don't know. But nonetheless, here we are and we're going to do what we normally do on Wednesdays, and let's do our midweek connection, uh, which is read the lectionary texts for today, talk about it, say a prayer, and hopefully um, discern what God will have for us today and how our lives might be transformed by reading his word. So I'm going to open us in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to you today, a day, uh, another day, when you give us your word and an opportunity to be known by you and loved by you. Lord, I pray that as we read these words today, that by your spirit, you would give us a good and a right interpretation. And then also, Lord, by your spirit, that you would transform our lives uh, to be more and more uh, in the image of your son, Jesus Christ, that we would be pleasing in your sight, Lord, and do those things that you've asked us to do, that we can be the people that you want us to be, uh, and that we can be people who share your good news in the world and build up the community faith together. We thank you and praise you. It is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're going to start off with Psalm 50. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest all around him. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds, for every wild animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the air, and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and all that is in it is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. You make friends with a thief when you see one, and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free rein for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your kin. You slander your own mother's child. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one just like yourself, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this then, you who forget God or I will tear you apart and there will be no one to deliver. Those who bring thanksgiving as their sacrifice honor me. To those who go the right way, I will show the salvation of God. Psalm 147 verses one through 11. Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Our Hebrew scripture prophetic word today comes from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. 
Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull, and stop their ears, and shut their eyes, so that they may not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and comprehend with their minds, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate, until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains standing when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. And from the New Testament, we'll read Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Paul, Silvanus, and Tim Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith during all your persecutions and the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God and is intended to make you worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. For it is indeed just of God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to the afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Those will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, separated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might, when he comes to be glorified by his saints and to be marveled at on that day among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you, asking that our God will make you worthy of his call and will fulfill by his power every good resolve and work of faith so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our gospel reading today is from uh, basically uh, John, what's that? John chapter 8, I can't even read. John chapter 8. Uh, then each of them went home while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple all the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. Back to our Psalm, Psalm 53. 
Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt. They commit abominable acts. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. They are all alike perverse. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, those evildoers, who eat at my people as they eat bread and do not call upon God? There they shall be in great terror, in terror such as has not been. For God will scatter the bones of the ungodly. They will be put to shame, for God has rejected them. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When God restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. And our final psalm today is Psalm 17. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From you let my vindication come, let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. As for what others do, by the word of your lips I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths, my feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge, from their adversaries at your right hand. Guard me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who despoil me. My deadly enemies who surround me. They close their hearts to pity. With their mouths they speak arrogantly. They track me down. Now they surround me. They set their eyes to cast me to the ground. They are like a lion eager to tear, like a young lion lurking in ambush. Rise up, O Lord, confront them, overthrow them. By your sword deliver my life from the wicked, from mortals by your hand, O Lord, from mortals whose portion in life is in this world. May their bellies be filled with what you have stored up for them. May their children have more than enough. May they leave something over to their little ones. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied, beholding your likeness. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Natalie. Aren't these basically the same exact psalms that we read last week? It really, I know, as we were reading them, I was like, we just did these. I think we just did these. Now, the, so, the other texts are different, so yes. clearly it's a different day. Yes. Um, and so, again, this is, you know, I find this, uh, it's a recurring theme, right? Who right. knew, right? God is always going to be giving us his word. But uh, this recurring theme of how uh, the lectionary, the daily lectionary texts do a lot of repetition, but also have new things, and you see how they're all connected. So, right. so it'll be interesting. I, I think I might have to go back and watch last week's video and see, see what we said. See what we said. <laughs> see, see what we said about those see those songs. We're still on the same page. And make sure we're still on the same page. Um, but in uh, but having those psalms connected to the different texts, I think bring out a slightly different um, emphasis. Right. So. Why don't we go ahead and start with then Isaiah chapter 6. And this passage is beloved by many because it has the, uh, the seraphim standing before the Lord or flying before the Lord, you know, crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It's this monumental picture of uh, an image of Isaiah being in the, the throne room of God. You know, right. starting off with this idea that King Uzziah died, the human king died, and now Isaiah finds himself in the throne room of God, the God who does not die, the God who cannot die, the God who is holy, holy, holy in three ways. Um, and Isaiah, uh, a prophet who is used to moving around in the throne rooms of other kings, you know, right. coming in and out to their courts, finds mm -hmm. himself in the throne room right and and he's like you know that i always love that verse five you know woe is me for i am lost you know i uh, i'm a man of unclean lips and i live among a people of unclean lips and yet my eyes have seen the lord the lord of hosts and it's just this this um i, I don't think that the words in our text really convey to us just kind of the terror that isaiah must be feeling 
Right. Um, um, this is bigger, grander, more majestic, more holy, more different right. than he is. And even Isaiah being a prophet, as good as he might be, in the presence of the Lord is, woe is me. It's me. Right. right. I, I'm unclean. I'm, and yet he confesses that. Right, right. And then he is made clean. Right. And so um, I think this, and this I think fits back with what we talked about last week and certainly what we were talking about before we turn on the camera today. It's this, as he approaches God, he recognize, recognizes the holiness of God. And just like you said, it doesn't convey just how big this was. Um, that recognition, and he comes and he the woe is me and it's this he comes before God in confession in humility mm -hmm. and then God in his graciousness then makes him clean because right. of this approach yeah um, I think that's a huge point to to think about it's uh, he comes in and confesses yeah it, well and then too as you go down you look down at verse 8 you know I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us mm -hmm. and it the same thing that here I am send me right and that obedience that um, submission to you know what is he signing on for he doesn't know he doesn't I mean, know he yet he doesn't know right he's gonna know times? he's gonna know shortly <laughs> <laughs> right but how many times but right but he just open endedly says here I am Right. Whatever you call me to do. Right. And the trust that that takes. And, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I think that, well, you have certainly responded to God's call in your life. You know, uh, uh, being commissioned as a lay pastor, I think that there is, uh, and it wasn't like an instantaneous kind of thing. You right. know, God's call can be direct like this. Right. Um, and it can be extended over time, but even before you started your classwork um, and writing your papers and all the reading that you had to do, all of those things, um, there had to be a choice that you made. Right. I'm, I'm going to respond to God's call. I will do these things. And, and we're still trying to, as we said earlier, we're still trying to discover what exactly this means and how exactly God's going to use you in a different way. But God has already been using you as you have responded faithfully to his call. Right. And and the open ended, you know, you, you said you said it's, it's this is an open ended call of God. It's like sometimes <laughs> right. I think we want God to go, you know, give us a little give us a little thing to do. Right. We can that, do that. We can do and that. Can be let, done. let me wrap my head around something and I can right. do a little thing. But I think there's there's a it's the call of the whole person. Right. It's, it's not that he said, uh, you know, a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. Um, uh, he's not, rec you know, Isaiah's not recognizing any self-righteousness at all. It's, right. It's, 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 it's humility before the Lord. It's open to what that call might be, even if that call ends up being kind of open-ended. Right. Um, and so turning to the actual call, this is one of the passages that I have frequently found most troubling or even sometimes most frustrating when I read Isaiah. You go from this wonderful vision of God's temple, uh, God's, uh, God's glory, and then it's, yeah, Isaiah go and tell them that they're going to hear things and not... Uh, comprehend. comprehend it, look and not understand, uh, make the mind of this people dull, stop their ears, shut their eyes, so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. So um, from a, uh, you know, the way we've always been brought up and learned from childhood that God is all-knowing, all-loving, all-forgiving, all these things, and here it just seems that that's not going to happen at this point. That there's some but, way that these people are not going to repent. But I look at point. that, and maybe I'm wrong, and please, you know. But you know what? Keep listening, but don't keep looking, but do not understand. The thing is, is the people can't do it themselves. Mm -hmm. They can't come in their own devices. They they have to come. There's nothing about their heart. Their hearts have to be open. Right. And so we can't say, you know what, I can study enough to understand this. I can look around me and I can somehow grasp mm. the fullness of this. Or, um, 
you know, I can listen. And if I just hear enough or in my mind, I can reconcile this and I can figure this out. And I think sometimes that we, we do, we think that we can figure things out um, on our own, but the reality is that it, it's more than that. And we don't have that capability um, in and of ourselves. And, and we see throughout scripture where God closes people's eyes or he shuts their ears or whatever, but when he chooses to reveal, and it's it's that that posture and that heart and all of those things, when those things are in the proper um, position, that's not the word I'm looking for, but when those things are the way that they should be, then that revelation can occur. And so we can't use our own senses and, and, and gather enough information. Right. And, and, so, and I think, yeah, I think that's exactly the right interpretation of that. It's, uh, you know, I think if you look at other places in Isaiah, it's it's about how people who, uh, you know, people who should have known better um, don't act better. Right. Um, and so, again, people who are depending on their own intellect, as you were saying, their own capacity to understand um, they're never going to understand. They right. need to put themselves in the proper posture before the Lord to receive them from the Lord. And, and uh, you know, Isaiah cries out, you know, like, how long, O Lord? And God says that he's going to bring judgment against the people that have perverted his justice and all these kind of things. Right. And so we, we see, again, the righteousness of God, the justice of God. Um, and, and ultimately, um, I think if Isaiah had been in, this, in the presence of God and not had the proper posture, then he would have been included in the right. people being judged. He would not have comprehended. He, he, he would, would not have right. understood. He would not have seen. He would not right. have, right. None of those things would have been revealed right. to him. So, right. so the posture before the Lord, I think, is, is, is a really good way to phrase that. And, and God wants us to be in, a, in the proper posture before him. Um, so if we jump to John 8, we, we see a big distinction then between the scribes and the Pharisees who have a posture of we are trying to trap Jesus right. and we are going to, you know, even though a woman caught in the act of adultery, I've always wondered, where's the man? If they were caught, I'm like, wait. Right. What, like, <laughs> that you can't do that you, by yourself. You can't, you can't do that by yourself. <laughs> it's hard. It's right. So, right. Uh, but, so uh, but people in a posture of trying to trap Jesus and have some... A charge to be able to bring against him. Well, and, and using this woman as their using this yes, woman right. to assert their power, right, right, and, and against her and against Jesus, right, both of those. And then ultimately, then compared to a woman who obviously shamed, humbled, humiliated, um, uh, threatened with death, physical death, right, uh, stoning, stoning. I mean, that's awful, real pleasant, right. Um, and so we just see a contrast between those two people who put themselves in a posture of authority mm -hmm. and one who then has a posture of humility and, and, and weakness. Even though, even though that was kind of thrust upon her, it's not like she went seeking out Jesus this way. Right. She, but she was brought before Jesus this way. And how does Jesus treat her? Um, well, and she doesn't try to deny. She right. doesn't try to right. speak up for herself. She just... Right. Here it is. I'm at your mercy. Right. Right. And then Jesus does give her that mercy. And I think that's a, that's a great contrast between the Isaiah 6 and John 8. It's, yeah, what is our posture? Hmm. What do you think Jesus wrote on the ground? You know, uh, people have talked about that where they say Jesus didn't, we have no... Uh, evidence of anything that Jesus permanently recorded. All we have him writing is something on the ground and we don't yeah. know. We just don't yeah. know what it was. It's interesting. It is interesting. Um, what do you think he wrote? I don't know. Like, I, I'm like, how does that play in? I'm like, did he write something that they read and they were like, mm. you know, or I don't know. Yeah. I just, I found it interesting that he was writing on the ground, you know, and then they come back to that. So I just, it's just interesting. Right. I don't have now, an well, answer now some, to that. Now, some people say that Jesus was trying to draw everyone's attention away from the woman um, so they could no longer be gawking at her, but they would be right. trying to figure out what, what Jesus is writing. writing. And so there's a, there's a redirect of attention. So maybe, maybe again, the, the posture. You know, he, he sits, he doesn't rush, he writes, he waits. Maybe too, he bends over to write. So it's like if somebody is talking to you and they just bend over and they start writing and they're not looking at you. Right. He didn't give 
weight or credence to Interesting. their charges. Mm. I don't know. Maybe. Or certainly didn't uh, give the honor that maybe the scribes and the Pharisees wanted for themselves. Right. It's they were just, looking for. Yeah. He just kind of, kind of ignored him. But when he he straightened up and said, "Let anyone among you who is without sin," you know, I mean, he drops that little bombshell there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and then goes back, back to what he's back doing. To, it's like it's just, it's, yeah. It's the a, body it's, language it's, is it's interesting. It's a great picture. It's a great. It's a great posture picture again. Uh, you get a crowd that's totally fired up and out for blood. You know, I don't know if you've ever been. Uh, the caught mob up in a mob mentality. mob mentality or mob situation where stuff's going on. I've read some articles that talk about normally sane people sometimes if they're surrounded by mobs doing stuff. Next thing you know, they're throwing bottles right. and breaking stuff. And they're like, wait, what did you do today? I don't even know. Why did you do that? I don't know. I don't know right. how strange it is that humans can get into that. Um, you know, pack that, tactics, frenzy. that frenzy, that yeah. frenzy, right? Crazy stuff. Um, so, if we jump over to the Thessalonians, and I think what's um, I think comparing this to the others, we have Paul giving great thanks to the to the church in Thessalonica about how their love and their faith is growing, and all of these things because of their ste- of their steadfastness in the face of persecutions. Right. And again, I think that really plays into the posture right because even in those difficult times even in this affliction there is this step back they are you know they are standing fast they are still looking to god they are still um recognizing um his role and his call and and his you know jesus is revealed and right um it's certainly mm-hmm. a posture of humility. People who are being persecuted generally are powerless to stop that. And so they have to come before the Lord and, and cast their burdens on the Lord. Uh, right. They have no recourse to uh, try to stop that person against them, persecution right. against themselves. They have to be before the Lord. Um, and then even this idea of uh, God will ultimately bring judgment against those who are doing the persecution and be delivering righteousness to those that have withstood that persecution. Um, you know, the day of the Lord, if you think about back to Isaiah 6, what's the day of the Lord going to look like? You know, it, it freaked Isaiah out, you know, and he's like, oh my gosh, it's like an Isaiah was a good guy. Um, what's that going to look like at the end when God comes to ultimately bring um, justice um, and, and judgment against the oppressors and, and righteousness to those who have withstood? So um, the posture, I, I, think, I think that's a good place to uh, emphasize today. Right. Hmm. But even, but even knowing in this Second Thessalonians letter how the persecutions that the people in the church face um, are, are useful for creating within us the proper posture that we should take. And that's, and that's a challenge. That's hard, especially in our culture today where nobody likes to, you know, nobody likes it anyway. Nobody liked it then. Right. Nobody likes it now. Right. Um, but where, where are we, um, you know, and I think about churches around the world that are being more intensely persecuted, uh, that their faith is growing and, and people are joining right. and things like that. And I just wonder what, what should the normal Christian posture be? Right. If there was threat of violence or, or risks, um, which I don't think that we face that. You know, we right. come to church Sunday morning. I we we participate in um, community of faith, and nobody's stopping us from doing that. There's no harsh reality that we choose to do that. But there are people in the world that do live with true risk of threat and bodily right. harm and all of that, and yet they risk it. Mm-hmm. And so, in the American culture, um, you know, I. No, would we would we stand fast? Would we? I don't know the answer to that. We don't have a lot of opportunities to pray Psalm 17 personally, right? right. You know, we, right. we we aren't surrounded by our enemies. We're not being persecuted, so uh, we don't pray a lot of Psalm 17. We probably pray pray a lot more, 
you know, Psalm 53 or 147. Some, you know, right. and, and, those, and those are good, all those are good psalms, but right. again, I think in the fullness of, of, of our scriptural text, um, God just knows the entirety of human emotions right. and, and living in that. Well, and I think even if you go back to that Psalm 50, um, which I believe we read that one last week, and oh. it's the talking about the sacrifices, and you know, you bring this, the blood and the goats and the, and right. the bulls, and 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 God, Old Testament called them to offer sacrifices, and then it's almost as if He I don't know, almost rejects that. But in that, I, I don't. It's the sacrifice is to be offered with the right posture right. because the sacrifice in and of itself was, is of no value. Right, right. Is of no value. So even whenever we come before God or we have that relationship with God and, and the interactions that we have with Him, you know, we can't go in there saying, look at what I have to offer mm -hmm. because the only reason we have anything to offer is because He has first given. Right. And so, and that goes back to the posture. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know. Yeah, all of the things that we give had already been given to us from right. him. Yeah, um, I think that's a good a good connection. Like the sacrifices themselves, they, they must mean something different than the ordinary giving of it right. would seem. Like, you know, you look at Isaiah 6 and it's not like God's got, you know, barbecue bull up there and he's eating on it and stuff it's just like nope you know you got spiritual beings that you know you presumably don't eat you know what does he says do i eat the flesh do i drink the blood and it's just, no 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 I, I, if i, I were hungry i would not tell if you. i were hungry i would not tell you uh but so again all that to get back to bring up thanksgiving those who bring thanksgiving as their sacrifice honor me and to, I, no, I, yeah, no, 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 I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, I was just thinking that that is the posture that we bring. Not not look at me and how much I am sacrificing to God. It's more, thank you, God, that I have the opportunity to even bring a gift. When you read that, which that was the first psalm we read today, that offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving, that, I'm glad you said that because I had forgotten about that, but um, that stuck out the very first, when you read it, um, and then it repeated, and I don't, I don't remember which text it was in today, but that Thanksgiving um, is repeated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, it's both on this Psalm 50, but I'm sure. Right, yeah. but it was in but another. In, in, it was in, the in second another. Thessalonians, okay. I give thanks. Yes, you know, and yes, so um, right, and I think you know it's with thankfulness, with recognition that it was given. It's it's posture. It's posture. So I guess that's the question for all of us today, right? What is uh, what is my posture before the Lord? What is your posture before the Lord? Um, are we are we regularly reminding ourselves of how good God is to us and how we should be thankful for that? And when there are challenges, that obviously we bring them before the Lord, but recognize that these challenges are actually meant for our good. And then just recognizing that even as glorious and holy and amazing as God is, that he desires to have a relationship with us. And that should be, um, uh, well, we should be thankful, but obviously then we should also be satisfied in that. Um, that was know. the final line that we read today was, in your image I will be satisfied. Oh, check you out. Look at that. Okay. Wow, was that Psalm 17? I believe it was. So. I don't know. I have to go back and look. Right, well, but I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure that's the last it's, thing that it, you read today. Yes, there it is. Was, as yeah. for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied beholding oh, your likeness. Check you out. That's yes. good. That's good stuff. Well, um, yeah, good stuff today. Yeah, well, God's good. Um, yeah, God is good. Be satisfied in Him. Have the proper posture before Him. Uh, and when and when we do mess up, just be grateful that He's such a forgiving, loving God. Right, He is gracious. He is gracious. He is gracious. Yeah. Well, why don't you go ahead and close us in prayer? All right. Thanks. Gracious Lord. Thank you for your words to us today. Thank you for this opportunity to share together and with those who are uh, watching, rather now or, or in future. Um, I pray that as we read these words and um, we come before you, that we do recognize um, your glory and your holiness. Holy, holy, holy are you. And that 
um, in that recognition that we do take the posture of humility and thanksgiving and love and honor for you. And I pray that as that happens, that we do um, begin to be transformed into your likeness and that that then also translates into love for others and that as we interact with other people that we um, can do that in a way that Jesus demonstrated so well. And in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us today. If you've got any questions or concerns, please do reach out to the church. We'd be happy to listen to you and to pray with you. I hope you all have a blessed day. Take care. Bye-bye.